Welcome to Inspiring Entrepreneurs, our 15th season, showcasing stories from outstanding business people presented by BDO Canada. My name is Dan Delmar, and Mike Newton is off this week. Let's welcome back in Ernie Furt, tax partner at BDO Canada. Welcome back, Ernie. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. How are you today? I am well. It's in the middle of tax season. We're pumping away, and uh, that's what we have to do at this time of the year. Excellent. Um, we're going to talk about the sharing economy today. So our guest is Faux Doucet, president and CEO of Partage Club. It's an app that lets people um, partage things, share things uh, in their same neighborhood. And they have um, services where people can um, create these sharing clubs within, within their own organizations or workplaces or municipalities. And it lets people avoid buying stuff um, and sharing them with their neighbors instead. It's a really neat idea. Yeah, I think it's great because I, I've seen situations where uh, you need this massive uh, carafe of, cafe, of of coffee that's like a 40-cup coffee machine, and you use it uh, once uh, every two years. So if you have that and you can share that or w- with friends, that's a cool thing. Right, and you can get that 40-cup carafe, you know, maybe on Amazon for 40 bucks, 50 bucks, and so a lot of people will go ahead and, and buy that. But do you really need to? And is, is that the best thing for the environment, or would it be better to just share one instead, um, exchange them. And so you pay a monthly fee, you get access to a Partage Club, and uh, you can share just about anything. And they they go pretty high up in terms of stuff you can share, um, um, up to vehicles even. So we'll, we'll get to, into that with with Fove as well. But first, let's tackle some uh, current events, news and notes. And uh, we want to talk about being a better boss, Ernie. So seven powerful ways to be a better boss and boost your bottom line. This piece is from uh, Inc.com, which I think has some um, pretty interesting tips. And the first one, which is uh, one of the early issues we talked about on on the show, is being okay with failure and uh, knowing how to bounce back from it. You got to make it safe to to, to, to fail, you know, because not everything is going to be successful. And 57% of uh, of people quit because of a bad boss. Not a bad organization, but a bad boss. So that, that's important. You have to be transparent and you have to communicate openly with, with your employees. Uh, you need to be an active listener is another one. Uh, you know, be an active listener. Don't sit there on your cell phone uh, looking at the sports scores while somebody's talking to you. It's just It's just not the right way to go. Give the people the full attention that they need. You know, focus on people's strengths and uh, and not on their weaknesses. Embracing a growth mindset is another on the list. And um, one really great tip for leaders is uh, making time to work on, on yourself as well. Listen, if you're expecting people to work on themselves, you have to work on yours. It's very simple. And I want to pick up on that note from uh, this piece on entrepreneur.com, how learning to take care of myself helps me take care of my business. Um, For entrepreneurs, uh, the writer uh, says, particularly women, balancing the myriad responsibilities of business ownership can be all-consuming. So what is your advice? Uh, Do you have a a self-care routine, Ernie? I didn't, but I'm starting it again. And you know what? At the end of the day, uh, you know, the pandemic uh, produced a lot of interesting things for people. For me, it it was not a great time. Uh, I had a nice weight gain, and it's time to lose it again. And when I grabbed hold of myself in order to do this, uh, I felt more positive about myself. And if I feel more positive about myself, it's easier to feel positive in the workplace and and demonstrate that positivity as opposed to demonstrating a negativity, uh, you know, which, which will lead, you know, to, to a lack of creativity. And you're going to be you're going to be tired all the time. Uh, you're going to be anxious. These are not good things. You know, anxiety and stress are a different thing, you know. Anxiety is a constant. Stress is something I had before the show because I had to read all the articles and make sure that I knew what I'm doing, okay, at the end of the day. So that's a stress, but that stress is alleviated very quickly. After you you deal with it, the anxiety remains. So if you're if you find yourself anxious, uh, time to make a change. Are you anxious right now? How can we how can no, we No, I'm not that? anxious at all right now. I'm a little okay. stressed, but I'm okay. Okay. It's just a little bit. I, just a little bit. It's it's March in the accounting world. Look at it. It's fine. It's, it's yes. Fine. Of course. 
Um, and I would say as well, during the pandemic, m- my health declined a little bit and I'm starting to rebound now and I'm um, starting to work in stuff into my daily routine uh, a little bit more, not just talking about meditation, but actually meditating in the day if you have too many stressors, um, making sure you get a, a good a good lunch period in, going for a little walk at some point um, during the day, in my case, maybe walking a dog. So um, I hope leaders are building in a, a little bit more um, self-care and uh, and making it routine. Well, one term that I found helpful, Ernie, is from a book called Atomic Habits uh, by um, a, a neuroscientist. And the, the term I, I seized on is called habit stacking. And so if you have a series of habits, part of your morning routine or your lunch routine or evening routine, and you stick to that stack of habits or, or chores and intersperse them with things like meditation or get, getting a quick stretch or workout in, um, you'll see your 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 lifestyle uh, and, and your leadership abilities benefit as a result. And learn a new hobby. Do something different. If you like woodworking, do some woodworking. You want to do, you like cooking? Take a cooking class. Take a wine appreciation class. Because at the end of the day, it's that varied uh, that varied day that'll help you pass through all the days and uh, and allow you to you know to to be good with yourself. Because the self care is truly a journey. And it's not something that you're you're doing in two minutes. And a lot of entrepreneurs, especially startup owners, will say to that, Ernie, well, I just don't have time. You know, I'm working 12, 15 hour days. I don't have time for all that. And it's important to understand the neuroscience of that because your brain actually needs rest to be optimal. So if you're working too long and you're not getting a little meditation or exercise in and you're not feeding yourself properly, it's impossible for you to work anywhere near 100 percent during those 12, 15 hours a day. 100%. You, you you have to take care of yourself first and take care of others and make sure everything gets done in the workplace at the end of the day. Yeah, systems maintenance, just like your hardware. Exactly. This Everybody one, needs an oil change, you know? <laughs> this one from Inc.com. Meet like a billionaire, five tactics to slash meeting times by 50%. I love this. Um, this meetings can really be unproductive sometimes. Well, what's your What's your biggest meeting pet peeve, time waster, Ernie? Uh, people chatting complete, you know, having that <laughs> five minute period at the beginning of a meeting, if not longer, where people don't realize you're having a meeting on Teams or on Zoom and that there's 12 other people in this meeting and everybody's talking about their personal uh, whatever at the, uh, in that meeting, it, which, it's, which is distracting from, from the, the main purpose. You know, you, you want to be able to do these meetings quickly. You want to be able to do these meetings efficiently and, and, and not be there hurting cats at the end of the day. Fair enough. Uh, here are some advice, um, you know, in terms of slashing uh, meeting time from Inc.com. Uh, inje- eject topics that do not require regular review. So if you don't have to review something, you have to make it part of the process every time necessarily. Another is hand out hall passes. In other words, uh, attendance uh, can be uh, not required sometimes. If you don't need to be there, um, you can always catch up later. And there are a lot of tools, by the way. Uh, we've been using Otter AI for quite some time and uh, you can get your transcript of the meeting and browse it later. If you're sick or can't go for whatever reason, you can catch up on the meeting uh, later on. Even the AI will generate summaries for you uh, of the meetings you can't attend. Um, leverage one-on-ones, uh, check in um, you know, one, uh, one-on-one with people as much as possible because that results in better productivity and adopt the 10 minute rule or 15 minute rule, 20 minute rule, whatever you prefer for your company. Uh, that is to say, uh, setting a, a hard cap on uh, the the length of that meeting. Yeah, it's always important to to have an end time in mind, and, and you know, meet meet up with people. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have these meetings uh, with the entire team every week. You can meet with people individually. It may prove more fruitful at the end of the day because certain things require discussions individually. Other other things require discussions in a group format. But try limit your time. Yep. And uh, I mentioned Otter AI for for meeting summaries. There are functions within other programs like Zoom uh, that'll provide the same thing. So that can catch you up there. And last but not least, one piece of advice that I've found the most practical is um, make sure there's a takeaway or an actionable that comes out of the meeting, not just, oh, thanks for chatting, guys. You know, what are we going to do to follow up on uh, on this action or take things to the next level? Exactly. So sticking with the um, the meeting theme, I, I love this article also from inc.com scientists pinpoint the exact moment people lose interest in a presentation um how long do you think it takes ernie roughly roughly i i would say 
10 minutes, roughly. Yeah. Because, so, you know, 10 minutes, I don't know, people have the attention spans of birds today. And 10 minutes is all they can take on one topic. So what are you going to do? You're going to have that. You're going to have your little meeting. You're going to, uh, how are you going to refocus people's attention? People need breaks in order for them to be able to re-engage. They don't need a physical break. They need something different. So if you show a video or two uh, on topic uh, a- after that 10 minute span, all of a sudden they're going to be re-energized and then Maybe you'll mix it up and throw somebody else into the presentation and they'll do a 10 minute span. We're not just estimating, by the way, this is science. A uh, Finnish study, according to, again, Inc.com, uh, says that it's it's around nine minutes, 59 seconds, according to the researchers. It's just around the exactly the 10 minute mark when people start to, as the report says, feel drowsy and some even fall asleep nearly, um, according to, uh, to what scientists were observing. So the takeaway, according to, uh, to them, as you mentioned, take the breaks, you know, have a stimulating, um, content in there to, to break up the meeting. And, um, they write that keeping people glued to your presentation is hard, uh, especially with so many distractions competing for your viewers' attention. So if you do have to go over the 10 minutes, well, make sure you break it up. And, um, for lack of a better word, I guess, Ernie, entertain your audience. Listen, entertainment is part of everything. That's what I try to do when I'm do when I'm making uh, a presentation. If I'm doing a tax presentation, for example, I will break it up with uh, observations, with humor, with questions. Because uh, if you engage your audience, then the audience feels part of it, and, and it's not that they're being just spoken to; they're part of the discussion. And I think that's an important way to go. And ask the questions, make sure people are commenting, and when they're commenting, great. If not, you know, you have to gauge your audience beforehand. Sometimes that's very difficult to do, but you do the best you can at the end of the day. Ernie Furt, all right, let's get going with the show and talk to our entrepreneur, Faux Doucet of Partage Club. They make an app that allows people in the same town or organization to share all kinds of items, thereby reducing consumption and uh, saving a ton of money. That's an amazing thing if you can do it. Fauve Doucet is with us. Fauve, welcome to Inspiring Entrepreneurs. Hi, nice to meet you. So likewise, and uh, first question is the easiest. What is Partage Club? So we are an application that you can download on your phone that allow you to basically borrow and share items of your day-to-day life with your community in an unlimited, save it, and positive way. There's no exchange of money between people. There's only an annual fee of 60 bucks to get access. So it's basically we're promoting uh, borrowing instead of buying for the environmental aspect of it, for the economical aspect, because we know life costs more and more these days, and uh, also the social aspect. So creating connection with your neighbors. What are some of the things that people like to borrow? Oh my God, you have no idea of how various <laughs> the catalog can be. Uh, but uh, what we see that is the most popular, there's four categories that are really coming in. It's um, anything related to the kitchen. So waffle maker or uh, like a portable barbecue, like th- this is the first category. The second one is anything related to tooling, like a drill. Uh, anything related to sporting goods. So uh, let's say uh, ice skates or even just ski and uh, things related to childhood. Um, So like if you think about just a stroller that you're going to need probably for a year, but some people like keep it between two kids. So what we see is that people are sharing also goods related to kids and childhood. Tell me about your background and where this idea came from. So um, I've been uh, uh, head of like big agency in terms of department. I was uh, always working in the marketing industry, Uh, but at some point, like I was also a mom of two kids and I felt it was completely outrageous. The number of toys that was just coming in, in my house, I had no space. It was costing a lot, but at the same time, I had no space to buy just like a bike to my kid. So I was kind of like living this tension of not wanting to overconsume, but at the same time, wanted to give the world to my kids. Uh, So this is where I started thinking about collaborative economy, the sharing economy, getting more and more aware of how it was working. Um, And at some point, I've just started to like do a study. I have done also a prototype, which we call in the tech industry an MVP. 
Uh, and after I've done a crowdfunding and it's been successful and I've been putting a bricks after another brick, got the courage to live my my big job to start that project that was really related to my values. Because I, I, I see you have a marketing background. So we go from marketing to tech. How do we get from marketing to tech? If we get surrounded by the right person. <laughs> <laughs> I think that honestly, what I found in marketing, because two times in my career, I was like in conflict with the marketing industry uh, related to my values. Uh, because they are also responsible of creating needs that are unnecessary, which is not good for our wallet and also for the environment. But at the same time, what makes me proud of being from that background is that I have a superpower. I have the superpower of changing behavior at scale by communicating, which is a really good power to have. But it's an I amazing wanted... power to have. <laughs> it's an amazing power, but I wanted to use it for goods. So I wanted to use it for people to act in the right way. Um, so that was, I think it's really powerful to have someone also coming from the marketing and communication industry coming in the tech background. And from the tech side, uh, really quickly I got, uh, I knock on doors of people that have been building tech companies, uh, startups. Uh, I've been reading books about the lean methodology. I have a hire uh, one of the best developers in town and I've learned. So let's talk about the tech a bit more because it does require a lot of work when you have such a large database of clients. They're sharing stuff with each other, communicating with each other, database of items, geolocation. Um, what are your server costs like? I'm wondering as well. How did it, uh, how was that entire uh, setup process just to get the physical infrastructure needed to run the app? Yeah. So the first thing is that there's a lot of provider, they're smart, uh, they are giving like the first year in credits or the first data in credits because they want to have a foot in the door. So usually you can have like a year or two years, depending on the data and the, the program they offer to just get, get things running. So you have the time to find your business model, get some money kicking in to, to have that set up. Um, the second aspect is that we've the way we finance our project was through a crowdfunding campaign. And this is not for every business. We have a business that is like more mass uh, B2C that touches a lot of people. So this is where we got our first $85,000. And we promised people that before the end of the year, we would give them the app, like the app would be ready. But when we released the app, it was like, crashing all the time uh but we've we've communicated that to people we've said like it's a beta version you're gonna give us feedback we're gonna co-create the app together so people have been also like more patient to it so th this is how we've been building it uh but it doesn't cost like it, you can think for an app like ours it can cost between one to two K per month to run it from a server standpoint. And after it depends on your technology, because when you build a technology, I don't want to get too technical, but you always have two choices. Either you build it from scratch. So it takes more manpower and time, but it costs less in the long run because you've been building it or you build base or you basically buy other pieces of the puzzle from other tech company, but after it's a recurring fee per month. So you need to cost, you need to check what's the most sustainable depending on where you're going. That's, uh, that's quite interesting. I, I noticed with the subscription base, you have a $60 annual fee, but you also offer a 90 day trial period. Okay. Now the 90 day trial period, what made you decide to do it that way? So the first value we have is trust because people are sharing items together and they need to trust each other because there's no exchange of money. There's no deposit. It's really they do it and we create connection with people. So trust is our number one value. And this is why also we don't say we're $59.99 per year. We're 60 bucks. It's like, this is the price. There's no influence. There's no manipulation. That's the price. And for us giving three months free trial is like, give it a shot. Try it. See the magic. See that when you post a need, in 24 hours, you're going to have five people responding to you. See how people are generous. See how you can save money. And after like trying it is adopting it. So for us, it was just making sure that because we're doing behavior change, people love buying. So they need to try and understand what's the value. It's it's a it's really innovative what we're offering. So um, so for us, that was kind of like a, a no brainer to give a chance to people to try it before. 
a little bit of an alternative from Facebook Marketplace or something like that, where people go and look for for used tools or used whatever. And here, they're they're not actually buying them; they're actually borrowing them. So it's quite a novel concept. Uh, it's the it, it's the old help neighbors helping neighbors at the end of the day. And uh, but you know, you run into one problem. I've run into this actually with my daughter who didn't return something for a year. What happens there? Have she done it on Partage Club or she done no, it? No, 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 no. She didn't return it to me. <laughs> That's the thing. With our app, we have like a sharing system. So when you ask for something, a book or anything, you need to ask for dates. And the borrower, the lender needs to also accept the dates. So there's kind of a little cont contract and you can see when it should come back and people get alerts. Because in our research, we found that people are kind of shy to ask the borrower to bring back their own object. <laughs> this is like an anthropologic kind of like, this is what we found. So because it's in the app and the app kind of keeps remind you that you're late, people respect those late. And if they don't respect, they can also uh, get um, uh, banned from the app. So this is the way that we're kind of like the bodyguard of the sharing, uh, the, 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 the sharing lifestyle. Um, and we're also looking uh, to also invest in insurance. So that's coming in. So that could be like this news that we're, we're talking in because we're getting more and more asked to also do car sharing. Because once you start like sharing your drill, the monopoly game, why not your car when you've built the trust? So uh, definitely insurance is going to be key for that. We're going to dig in a bit more to where your venture is going. And we'll talk about maybe insurance and some other spaces that you'll go in into the future. But just uh, real quick before you head to break on, on the basics, in terms of revenue generation right now, is it all subscriptions? Uh, it's all subscription, but the, mo the majority of our revenues coming from the corporate sectors, uh, which was kind of not seen at the beginning. So we've been talking about you, me, like we could get our subscription of 60 bucks. But now we're getting also um, cities that are buying licenses for their citizens. We have six cities. Uh, we have educational institutions like kindergarten, universities, uh, college that are buying basically licenses. So employees and um, students can create their own club and share together. We have companies that are doing this for their employees. So they have their private club and their neighborhood club. Same thing to build connection within uh, in the corporate sector. And it's also like a sustainable action in their development uh, plan. And we have also uh, real estate promoters that have uh, residents and they have not that many rooms. So they're also giving those subscription. And this is 80% of our revenues. I love the clubs within the clubs, um, especially uh, I'm wondering, I'm, sh I'm sure you're in some rural municipalities, perhaps, where this is really useful as well. Yeah. Excellent. And um, Fove, I really like the line. Uh, I do a lot of marketing and copywriting. It's what I do mostly. And so I love a good headline. And uh, when you take on Amazon in uh, on your website, I think that's really, really cool. And the line is, it's faster than Amazon Prime. I love that as a marketing line, faster and of course, much cheaper as well and better for the environment. Um, who came up with that line? Uh, this looks like it might be a customer that, that did. It's actually like we, we got three customers, three members. We don't call it customers. We call it members because they're not buying. Uh, I came up with those lines. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And And when you look at Amazon, I mean, are you looking at them as a competitor in a sense? Uh, yes, actually, yes. You know what? Because when we look at just only in Canada, the practice of buying, what we see uh, in terms of the second hand, 50% uh, are coming from buying, uh, the buying, 30% from giving, only 10% is renting and borrowing. So people in their day-to-day -day life don't borrow. So we don't have that many competitors. Uh, so we think that where we're going to get market share, if we think in terms of transaction, it's going to be from people buying new, coming from Amazon, Costco, uh, Toys R Us, like name it, and also secondhand. So people that are going to marketplace and they're opening their phone to buy something. What we want people to do is like, when I need something, I don't buy it new. I don't buy it secondhand. I can borrow it. That should be the first thing you think about because you save money and it's good for the environment. 
on that theme, when it, it, you want to encourage people borrowing, so are, are you going to try to get a high placement on like almost like a Facebook marketplace so people can actually see you, see you pop up and say, hey, maybe there's an alternative here? Uh, that's a really good point. We've been thinking about that, how we can get out get outside of the app because people like download the app, love the concept, love the lifestyle, but sometimes they just forget. And after they just, because we get bombarded by advertisement and it's everywhere, people have the reflex to buy, to be able to enjoy something. So that's a really good point being on the, we call it the, I like to call it like the place, not of the crime, but like where you're going to buy something to get really this this moment of like, should I really need to to buy this thing that I'm going to use maybe one time or not even one time, like one time per two years? Should I really need to buy it? So that's a really good point. That's a good uh, idea. <laughs> I, I thought it's interesting because because at the end of the day, uh, I use rent to tool places when, when I need something big and and, and fancy. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to go buy it. You know, I will have your ba- people have their basic products, their basic drills, their basic hammers. But there's certain things that they won't you know, go out and buy. If you want to make a dryer hole in a cement thing, they're not going to have that. So you're going to go to a rent a tool place to get that. And rent a tool places would be, a, you know, competition for part of what you do, not obviously the real estate area, but uh, if somebody is trying to do home renovations by themselves, uh, this is a very good area. I would say to that, true, people rent, but I would say again, borrowing and renting, it, they, I, they've mixed it in the study together. It's 10% of what people, how they, they get access to things. So we're not doing that really often, maybe once per year, maybe once a year. It's really not a practice that it's democratized. And second thing is that what we see is that the price between renting and buying is not enough big for the trouble that it is to like reserve the tool, go to the place, make sure you bring it back, doing the deposit, all of this, sometimes it's like maybe 50 bucks. So people are saying, okay, I won't bother. I will just buy it that time. Maybe for a specific object or tool that you said that no one has it for sure, but it's really um, not our day-to-day life. Like if you think about waffle maker, a camping tent, a, a golf club, like a, a bag of to just play golf one time a year. Let's say me for me, for my kids, the number of toys that I borrow, it's crazy. Even like at their birthday, now my kids, because they've been living with Partage Club, they're like, they're asking for activities because they know they can have her, they can have all the toys they want whenever they want, right? So it's a new way of thinking. In terms of small items, I mean, certainly uh, super practical for young families, but how big are you going to get with some of the items? I mean, uh, are we going into cars or even homes where there are apps that, of course, are very specific to those uh, larger ticket items? Is, is that on your radar? We got the RV, uh, Westphalia's uh, motos that have been uh, borrowed without insurance because we don't have the insurance yet. So we're going to have it. We're working on this. Um, so people, when they have like this trust aspect, uh, they're really keen to share more than we expect. Actually, I'm going to tell you something that is super counterintuitive. And we found it in uh, our first prototype is that we're basically building a marketplace. So there's demand and offer. So people that are borrowing and people that are uh, lending. Okay. And when you build a marketplace, even if it's for selling, sharing, Okay, you always have one side that is harder to stimulate and you need to find it quick because this is where you're going to put your energy and the functionality of your product and your marketing to make sure like it it gets balanced. So my question to you, and it's always my interactive question, what do you think is the hardest or that we need to stimulate? Is it that people feel comfortable sharing or people that feel comfortable asking? Wow, it's it's the second question. It's the second one. Because people are not comfortable asking. People may be comfortable sharing, but you have no idea unless you ask. I, I mean, it's so hard to to choose one because on the one hand, society is pulling us kind of further apart, right? And and so we're shy, we're becoming increasingly isolated, somewhat antisocial. And on the other hand, there's more of a convenience to buy stuff very instantly with Amazon Prime and all of that. So you're working against two very difficult forces that in some ways, uh, the I mean, the algorithm kind of controls both forces, right? 
So um, I would say that uh, it's really clear when you try doing it with people and it's asking. So you were right. <laughs> it's really uh, asking. So when people say, I need, you can have 10, 10 people answering in 24 hours. People love sharing. So when you know that, you know that you need to stimulate people asking versus sharing. So basically, and it creates trust between people. So once you start doing it, and it needs only one time that you share and you trust the person, you met the person physically, you got to chat a bit because you want to make sure the object comes back. This is where actually you can after share bigger items. And a little overtime now with Fauve Doucet from Partage Club. Um, so Fauve, uh, I know we want to get a little bit into insurance, Ernie, because that's that's very interesting. How do you prevent people from abusing the system, um, especially when you have so many people sort of uh, sharing their own personal belongings? Um, what are your thoughts on, on on the insurance angle, Ernie? Well, I think the insurance is very is very important, especially all of a sudden you're you're borrowing uh, some type of tool or, or or a baby carriage and it breaks. So what happens when it breaks? Uh, you know, do the people have to, if there's no insurance, then the people have to deal with it together. That could be stressful. So the question is, if the insurance is brought in, then uh, that can alleviate that stress. Fove? So currently, uh, what we've seen in our study is that insurance would be important but it was not the one piece to validate when we we're building the business. Like people would still share if there's no insurance. There's other way to trust people than insurance. So this is why we haven't tackled this first. We've put this to later because uh, people, there's other ways like uh, you can have feedback uh, review from people, creating clubs because people are living close from each other's. So that builds trust. So what we've done is we have a code of honor when you subscribe and the borrower needs to bring back the object the way it was. Because sometimes it breaks because things break when they get used. <laughs> so uh, we do a ed education on that. It's not because you, you, you have been like mean or whatever. It's really just because you've been using the object. So you need to repair or you need to buy uh, the object uh, to replace it. And it happens, I think, five times out of like thousand and thousand of sharing actions. So people are really like um, careful the way they do things. But we know that insurance just gonna uh, help us take up this little friction point of like, what if something happens? Like, I don't wanna feel like uncomfortable bringing back the object uh, the way it wasn't, right? Uh, like in a, in a bad, bad situation. So we're working on insurance right now. And it could also add to your revenue stream. Yeah. Which is <laughs> Good quite point. interesting. And again, I want to go back to the, the clubs within the clubs. Um, do you have a lot of, you said you had some schools, perhaps some healthcare institutions, you know, people go to workplaces and they're very large and don't know their coworkers and they can, you know, essentially do transactions very quickly like that. Um, can you give me maybe an example of, of how you work with a large institution and why one that might be listening uh, might want to get involved with Partage Club? Yeah. So right now we have four different segments outside of like uh, the, the people that are just buying their subscription of 60 bucks a year. So we have cities that are buying licenses for their citizens. Uh, we have companies that are building this uh, as an advantage for their employees. So they create their clubs. It creates retention and collaboration. Uh, it helps their uh, employees save money. And it's good also for their sustainability and uh, responsible plan for the year. Uh, we have also educational institutions like universities, kindergarten, college that are offering this for their employees and students to share together. And we also have real estate promoters that are giving uh, the licenses for their residents because usually they don't have that much room also to, to, to store items. Just to confirm, you're only in Quebec, is that correct? Yeah, we get we starting getting some members that are a bit on their island on other provinces or or countries, but in Q2 we're looking to expand in east uh, east coast of the United States and uh, BC. Make sure your insurance stuff is in place when you go to the states. <laughs> Why? Because they're very litigious down there, so they're <laughs> going to blame everybody for something that breaks. So that's something to be careful on. <laughs> Please see Ernie uh, Fove uh, when you do go down to the States. Uh, Fove do said, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And we're going to have your one piece of advice for inspiring entrepreneurs in just a few moments. 
Sounds good. But first, let's check in with our BDO specialist. Juliana Papandrea is Senior Manager, Business Services Outsourcing at BDO Canada. Welcome back to the show, Juliana. Thanks for having me, Dan. And Ernie, talking about outsourcing, a lot of companies, especially startups, um, could certainly benefit from outsourcing parts of um, of their, their operations, uh, even in tech. Outsourcing is very important, but people have to understand, first, first of all, before we get into the questions, what outsourcing is. So, Juliana, just take a minute and explain what outsourcing is. Okay, so business outsourcing is when you hire someone outside of your business to take care of certain aspects of the business. In this case, we're talking about accounting needs for a business. So rather than have an internal accounting department for a small and medium-sized company, it would make more sense to hire someone, an outside specialist, to take care of that. So that's why the business would choose to outsource their accounting needs. Usually they would choose it because... It could be a startup, small, medium-sized business, and uh, it would be easier and less expensive for them to, you know, outsource it. So to hire an outside specialist for that. Yeah, because Uh, when you have an inside specialist, uh, you're paying big money and you may not need them full time. uh, While in a small environment, you know, you'll have the access to that specialist outside and you will hire them only for a short period of time so you can do what you need to do and and it will be more task oriented. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So the company can, you know, benefit from huge savings because you don't have to have these uh, expert professionals on your payroll full time. You can have them just when you need them, just to perform certain tasks and, you know, when you need them. And um, and like I was saying in the, the last time I was on the show, we were talking about leadership teamwork and employee support and what's the best way to support your employees it's surrounding them with experts and specialists when you need them and uh and so this is something that uh, we feel is is very important it's a key uh it's key for businesses are there any other benefits that a smaller medium-sized business would get from outsourcing oh definitely there's so many i mean besides cost savings efficiency um there there are so many uh, i mean we could look at um you know external accounts i mean we're using the latest software you know there's data security there's uh, you know information's getting backed up so company doesn't have to worry about this doesn't have to have it worry about it and there's also you know less risks to bear for the company because they have the experts bearing the risk so there's time savings. There's so so many benefits. We really see, we really see the benefit, especially because it's allowing business owners to focus on what they're good at, to focus on their day-to-day operations, not have to worry about uh, their accounting and payroll uh, issues. So, how can the outsourcing help that company achieve their goals? Well, um, you know, like I mentioned before. The experts can help management in their decision-making process. They could help plan for financial growth and expansion. Specialists are always up to date with compliance measures, and and they usually have extensive market knowledge and a pool of resources in various fields to help the company succeed. When you have experts taking care of the books, the result is cleaner, and you have more accurate financial reporting at the year end as well. It's basically a concept of leverage, what you have here with outsourcing. So, so you're, you're, you're leveraging your expertise. You do, you focus, as you said, on what you're good at and allow the other experts to focus on what they're good at. So you can produce a great product, both internally and externally, uh, for, uh, for, for any company in, in a smaller, a medium sized, uh, range. And that's a, that, that's an amazing thing for, uh, for, for clients, if they can get what, you know, the, the stuff that they need done, but they just don't have the expertise in house, they can get it outside and they should be turning to you for this kind of stuff. This is, this is great. That's exactly it. And we see how difficult it is to hire, you know, uh, experts in house. So this is the perfect, perfect solution for, for everyone. That's great. I really, we really appreciate your time coming on the show and, and telling us about all the, uh, all the outsourcing and, I'm sure there's many people have many questions on this kind of stuff and they can contact you in order to get this done. Absolutely, Ernie. Thanks for having me. Juliana, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dan. Uh, Senior Manager of Business Services Outsourcing at BDO Canada. And don't forget, you can always head to bdo.ca for the latest in thought leadership on outsourcing and many other issues. Expert advice from the entire team, bdo.ca. 
And as we come to the end of our show, let's ask our entrepreneur, Fauve Doucette, president and CEO of Partage Club, for her one piece of advice for inspiring entrepreneurs. Fauve, what do you think? Uh, I have so many advices, <laughs> but uh, one that keeps to my mind, and I think that's been our strain, is get surrounded by people that don't have their ex- your expertise. So be humble, put your ego aside. And once you like don't know something or you need to like just learn quicker, uh, make sure that you build like an, an advisory committee. If you're just starting, you don't need to build like a board yet. Uh, need to like just knock on doors, ask for advice and ask how they've done it. Uh, me, it was tech. I didn't know tech. So I found people that know tech <laughs> because I'm coming from the marketing advertising background. But I also found people coming from my own background to challenge me. So I would say get surrounded quickly because it's bigger than you. Uh, this is how we grow quicker. Ernie, uh, what a really great app. Uh, Fove, congratulations. And an example of the uh, ever-growing uh, sharing economy. Ernie, final thoughts? Well, I think it's great. You know, uh, you're promoting sharing is caring. And imagination truly is your only limitation here as to what you want. Um, they're focusing on goods today, maybe services tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I didn't ask one question, which I really wanted to ask, which was, what is the weirdest thing anybody asked for? Uh, I got in my neighborhood, like a cage for bats, but I live in a suburb next to Montreal. <laughs> so I think that's like one of the weirdest things that I've seen or sometimes people are asking things that I just don't know what it means so yeah Fo, thanks very much thank you Fo. thank you Armando you can subscribe to Inspiring Entrepreneurs Montreal on iHeartRadio Spotify Apple or your favorite platform and we'll see you back here next week thank you Ernie my pleasure Talk.